And uh, I'll begin again. Welcome, everybody. My name is David Kramer. I am the director of the library at the Jewish Theological Seminary. Uh, we are privileged, and it is our extreme pleasure to be able to offer programs like this uh, to introduce you to books that we judge are of some importance uh, for Jewish students, the Jewish public, the Jewish community, and beyond, uh, because all of these books, while being of local interest, should be of international interest as well. And that is certainly true uh, for a book like this. Uh, we at JTS, uh, those of you who know our institution, certainly know that we believe that it's uh, impossible to understand anything truly unless we have some sense of its history. Uh, and this is a book which is terribly pertinent to the affairs that we see in our world today, providing something of the history that will give us a deeper understanding and enable us really to get a sense of what's going on and maybe to make some reasoned judgments about it. Uh, so Oren, you, you've got a big job for us. Uh, I know that you've been speaking about this and when we discussed what precisely you would focus on, uh, you said, you know, in th these days it's impossible just to stick to the book because the book has many implications and we invite you certainly to address those. Uh, Oren Kessler uh, is uh, a journalist. He has been Arab affairs correspondent for the Jerusalem Post, uh, editor, translator, and writer for the English edition of Haaretz, research fellow at the Henry Jackson Society uh, in London, and his work has appeared in a wide variety of publications. Um, so he, you, Oren, have got the expertise that's necessary to provide us with the foundation of understanding which we will gain today. Uh, and I invite you to uh, tell us about your book, tell us what we can learn and how it applies to our understanding of today's events, and we'll see where it goes, please. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kramer. Thank you uh, to JTS for having me. It's, it's a real honor. Um, when we first uh, agreed to hold this event back in August, the, the plan was to talk exclusively about, about my book, which, of course, I was very happy to do. I'm very proud of my book. I hope everyone uh, picks it up uh, and reads it, and, 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 uh, and you're welcome to contact me and let me know what you think. Uh, but I, since October 7th, and it's been exactly a month now, it simply hasn't felt right for me to speak exclusively about my book. I don't think it would be uh, fair to my audiences. I don't think it would feel right to myself. It's what's consumed me emotionally, uh, intellectually, and, and personally for the last month, as I'm sure it has many of you. So I'm going to, I think, start by talking about my own personal experience of that day as someone who, who does live in Tel Aviv um, and someone who has covered these issues for, for many years. Uh, and then to zoom out from sort of to, to a sort of more analytical perspective, and then to bring in my book for some uh, historical context. And I do want to leave ample time for, for Q&A because I know a lot of people have questions and comments and thoughts and feelings about the situation. I think it's very important to be in, in community in times like this um, and to share those thoughts and, and, and feelings. October 7th, 2023 was my wedding day. My partner and I, Clara, uh, again, we live we live in Tel Aviv, but we had planned to get married in New York City, in Central Park, in one of those lovely uh, gazebos, in a very intimate ceremony with just my immediate family, her immediate family, uh, a rabbi and a photographer uh, and a guitar player. And so we came to New York about two weeks before the wedding day in order to iron out all of the details. Now, my my partner is Argentinian American, and she's quite old school in many ways. Uh, and so she informed me a few days before the wedding that the, the, the night before the wedding, we would not be sleeping in the same room. So I could have the uh, newlywed suite in, in Midtown, the Omni at the Omni Berkshire Hotel, and she'd be uh, with her family at, a, at an Airbnb in New Jersey. So I woke up um, that Saturday. Uh, I woke up at 8 a.m. sharp because my phone rang and I saw that um, 
Speaking of which, let me set the timer to make sure I don't go over or under. Um, and I, so I, 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 my phone rang and I kind of groggily, groggily looked at it. And I saw that the, um, the, the number of the person who was calling me was in India. And I thought that's strange. I had done a few media hits in, in India over the years, but it seemed a strange time to be calling. And so of course, once you have your phone in your hand, you start to see the, the notifications and the alerts. And, um, and I see an alert that says uh, 40 people, 40 Israelis killed in Hamas attack. And I said to myself, what on earth? 40 Israelis killed, how on earth could that happen? I'm thinking, was this, was this some, uh, you know, a soccer game and, and, and people were just completely exposed and Hamas rockets just, just decimated them? And I'm, I start to read the article. If you'll recall, back in the dark days of the Second Intifada, there was a notorious attack on Passover in 2002, the Park Hotel massacre in Netanya, which is an awful, awful bloody day that's, that Israelis still talk about quite a bit. Well, 30 people were killed in that, on that awful day. And now I'm getting an alert in 2023 that it's 40 people. So I'm reading the article. I'm trying to understand uh, what happened. And mind you, this is 8, 9 o'clock a.m. New York time. So this is, we now know, this was eight or nine hours after the attack began. And I'm reading and I'm reading and I'm just not understanding. Was it rockets? Was it, were they shot? How, how were these supposedly 40 people killed? I don't understand. And I continued not to understand until I went onto Twitter and I hit that little button that says images. And uh, that's when I started to understand because I saw images of seven people lying in their own blood at a bus stop uh, in Sterot. I saw young people at a music festival in the desert uh, running frantically as gunshots rang out behind them. And I saw one of those, I saw a video of one of those festival goers, a young woman we now know is named Noah Algamani, being forcibly placed on a motorcycle by bearded men in bandanas um, as she desperately reaches out to her boyfriend who's being placed on another motorcycle. And, um, and so I wrote a message to my family and I think I'll actually share it with you if I can find it. And let's see here. Well, that's strange. You see, I'm also not very good at Zoom. Share screen, there we go. So I wrote to my sort of family uh, WhatsApp group saying terrible things are happening in Israel today. Mass Hamas infiltration of the South, 40 plus killed, unknown number of civilian and soldiers captive in Gaza. Nothing like this before. Thousands of rockets. Half an hour later, I wrote, this is 10 a.m. almost, Death toll is now, now over 100 with some 800 injured. It's a real nightmare. Awful videos coming out of civilians, including women being abducted and taken to Gaza. It's not even clear how these 100 plus people died. Again, this is 10 hours after the attack began. Hamas controlling several Southern towns and villages, nightmare situation. And my brother, my older brother, as you can see here, responded with exactly two words, which were, my God. And so I had a real dilemma about, well, I was really torn about whether to go through with the wedding, as you can imagine. And I remained quite torn until I got a message from my friend uh, Nathaniel in Tel Aviv. He's, he's an American guy like me who made Aliyah. And uh, he said, don't let anything interrupt or ruin your simcha, your joyous occasion. And I thought, he's right. So we went through with it. We didn't know the extent of the disaster we know it was we knew it was very bad um but we went through with it and it was lovely despite everything and we had a lovely dinner afterwards and clara and i went back to the hotel and we weren't exactly in festive mood but we caught up on the news tried to digest, digest it all and we went to sleep well the next morning um my dad called me and uh and he, both my parents are Israeli, and my dad's an optical physicist. He's quite a practical man, uh, not overly emotional, one might say. Great guy, but not overly emotional. 
I've certainly never heard or seen him cry. My dad called me and he said, have you talked to anyone in Israel? And I said, well, uh, Amir, my cousin, uh, called, but I missed the call. I assume he wanted to just update us on the, on the situation and probably to say, Mazal Tov. Um, and I can hear my dad's voice cracking and he uh, says just one word, which is uh, Tomer. Tomer. And so Tomer is the son of my cousin, Michal. Uh, we're a very small family. I only have three first cousins in the, in the world, two of whom live in Israel. Um, and Michal is one of them. Tomer is her middle son. And he, uh, I knew, was a platoon commander in the Nahal recon elite reconnaissance unit. Um, in fact, I will show you a photo of Tomer, if this would like to cooperate. There we are. Um, and so uh, Tomer was, was killed that, that morning, very early. Uh, we now know, fighting Hamas terrorists um, at Kerem Shalom, right next to Gaza. He fought extremely bravely. Um, he, uh, he and his comrades protected the kibbutz of Kerem Shalom that day. Uh, three soldiers, including the brigade commander, were killed, uh, and inclu including Tomer. And uh, two members of the security team were killed. But not a single civilian was killed at Kerem Shalom. Not a single civilian was abducted at Kerem Shalom, unlike so many southern communities. And so I think I'll keep his photo up for a moment. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about Tomer and his family. Um, Tomer's family, his parents, Ran and Michal, are very much um, Israelis of the old left. They're very much uh, peaceniks. Uh, they were at the protests every week against the judicial overhaul. Uh, Tomer's father actually, for years, would volunteer to pick up sick Gazan kids take them to hospital in Israel and then bring them back. Uh, but Tomer always wanted to be a warrior. There was nothing militaristic about him. He almost never talked politics. Um, uh, he was a lovely guy. And I know everyone uh, always says that when, when, when somebody dies, they, they always eulogize them in the most glowing terms, of course. But Tomer really was just the warmest, most genuine person my uh, Clara and I would always marvel every time we met him at what a uh, genuine uh, lovely person he was he was always uh, smiling he was perhaps you could tell in that photo he always had this expression as if he was uh, in on a joke that perhaps you were not in on uh, and he always wanted to be a warrior he always when, when we'd ask his parents what to bring him for um, for a holiday or for his birthday they would say bring him a a plastic sword or a plastic shield that'll uh, that'll that'll make him happy. He again, he wasn't militaristic. He wanted to defend his country. He wanted to defend his family, and that's what he uh, died doing. He died. Um, he died uh, fighting. And it took, as you know, in Jewish tradition, we uh, were called upon to bury the dead as quickly as possible, but the body count was such, and remains such, as I understand, that it took quite a long time to be able to bury Tomer. The army simply didn't have the resources. It didn't have the six officers who are supposed to carry the casket on their shoulder. Uh, I understand they even had a shortage of grave diggers. And so it took five days and a lot of pushing to be able to um, hold a funeral for Tomer. And I do want to talk for a moment about uh, just that, about body counts, about death tolls. And I promise this whole uh, Zoom conversation will not all be grim and dark. I will, I will certainly insert some rays of light, some points of light by the time I'm through, but I do think it's important to look head on at what's, what's happened uh, and to, to deal with it honestly. Um, I'm sure you've heard that this October 7th was the bloodiest day for Jews since the Holocaust. Well, it was. Uh, it was it was by far the bloodiest uh, day in Israeli history without any close competitors. So the second bloodiest day in Israeli history was the first day of the Yom Kippur War in 1973. 
Well, on that day, about 300 people were killed, all of them soldiers. And as you know, on October 7th, exactly a month ago, uh, the death toll was somewhere around 1400, the vast majority of them civilians. Uh, seniors, children, babies, men and women uh, killed in brutal ways that I don't need to go over because we all know at this point. The second bloodiest day for civilians was during the Second Intifada, of course. The worst day of the Second Intifada saw 122 people killed. So this is obviously over 10 times that many. And this statistic I found rather mind-boggling. More people were killed on October 7th than in the entire Second Intifada, which lasted three or five years, depending on how you count, and remains an open wound in Israeli society. The hostages are an almost entirely new element here. Of course, Israel has had its people taken hostage, taken captive before. I'm sure many of you will remember the name Gilad Shalit, who was captive by taken captive by Hamas in 2006, uh, released five years later, but only after a debate in Israeli society that nearly tore the country apart about what to do about Gilad Shalit. On the one hand, we can't leave him there in Hamas captivity just to, to wither away. Think about his poor mother and father. On the other hand, at what price will we release him? And of course, in the end, Israel released 1,100 Palestinian prisoners, most of them convicted terrorists, in exchange for Shalit. So what on earth are we, I say we, because of course I live in Israel, going to do now? Are we going to, there are 242 hostages in Gaza, last I checked. The vast majority of them civilians, children, women, seniors, babies. Are we going to release 200,000 Palestinian prisoners? Well, there are not. There aren't 200,000 Palestinian prisoners. Last I checked, there were about 6,000 Palestinian security prisoners. So I will have to leave that question unanswered because I simply don't, don't have an answer to it. So, you know, I tweeted the other day, when I think about uh, what happened a month ago, which is all the time, there's one word that just keeps echoing in my, in my head, and it's nightmare. Nightmare. I can't imagine things going worse. Uh, I don't think there was a page in the IDF playbook for what happened on 10-7. I think there was a page about, you know, what happens if Hamas breaches the border, kills a few Israelis, and tries to take over a kibbutz. I think that scenario was discussed. I don't think any scenario was ever discussed in any IDF back room in which 3,000 uh, Hamas terrorists pour over the border, pour, breach the wall, run riot for hours and hours and hours, kill 1,400 people in sadistic ways, and then take 240 plus hostage. I don't think that scenario was ever imagined by the IDF or the Shin Bet or the government. Now, I promised uh, rays of light, and here they are. I think since October 7th, we've seen the most beautiful side of Israel emerge. I think we've seen uh, Israel Hayafa, the beautiful side of Israel. I think we've seen, you know, in, in, in my opinion, and I think that of many Israelis, this government has not stepped up, to put it mildly, to care for the country uh, since October 7th, to care for those in need. But in that vacuum, there's been just this tremendous grassroots effort, you know, in the city where I live, Tel Aviv, alone, some 15,000 15, people have come together in this uh, logistical center to collect clothing and house the, 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 the newly made homeless people who have lost their homes, who have lost everything, people who have been evacuated uh, for their own safety. You've got restaurants delivering all of their food to soldiers. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, you know, my while I'm here in, in New York, our apartment is empty. And uh, we are, we're in touch with some strangers who know some other strangers who are, uh, who are in touch with someone from the South who needs a home. Um, and that's going on throughout 
the country. So it's a really, you know, there's a there's an expression in Hebrew, kol uh, Israel arivim All of Israel is responsible for one another, and I think we're seeing that really being uh, played out at the moment. And let's not forget what Israel looked like before 10-7. This is a country that was torn apart by the judicial overhaul push between opponents and proponents of this overhaul. And there was a, there was an ugliness and a, and a bitterness uh, among Israelis that I hadn't seen before. And now, again, this just tremendous outburst of, of, of unity and solidarity, which I think is, is very moving, very inspiring. And I think that's actually a good uh, segue into into the topic of my book. The my book, uh, Palestine, nineteen thirty six, is about the first. Uh, it's about the Great Arab Revolt of nineteen thirty six to thirty nine during the British Mandate, a decade before Israel's creation. And um, that revolt, as as uh, you might imagine. It was an Arab revolt. It was waged by Arabs. But I argue that this is as much a Jewish story as an Arab one. I argue that the Jewish counter revolt, the Jewish transformation, transformation uh, that took place as a result of the revolt is a crucial uh, and a forgotten chapter in the story of how most of Mandate Palestine became the state of Israel. And I argue that the, the Jews of the time led by David Ben-Gurion, even in this early uh, era were really the Jewish and Zionist leadership were, were experts at turning adversity into advantage. And I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. I just want to step back uh, for a moment and talk about how this revolt began and backdrop to this revolt. You know, oftentimes when I start uh, telling people about my book, they say, oh, you mean um, Hebron, right? The Hebron, Hebron massacre, to which the answer is, is no. Uh, the Hebron massacre occurred seven years before the core of my book begins. It was a very grim and gruesome few days in which 133 Jews were, were killed in ways that recall 10-7 in many ways in their cruelty um, in Hebron and a few other places. But I, I argue that's all that they were. This was an outburst of, of terrorism, of, of riots, but it was not a sustained uh, nationalist uprising. It wasn't an intifada in the parlance of our times. The first time we saw anything like that was, uh, you guessed it, in, in 1936. And so the the essential backdrop to this revolt is uh, a demographic one. I'm sure you've heard the, the expression, uh, uh, dem, what is it, dem demographics is destiny, demography is destiny. So I think that's still true uh, in many ways, certainly in, in Israel. Uh, and it was certainly true at the time. The, the uh, Hitler comes to power in January 1933. There are other anti-Semitic movements on the rise across Europe and Hungary. Romania, Poland. And in that period of the first half of the 1930s, the Jewish population of uh, Mandate Palestine doubles. And it's approaching 30% of the entire population. It's approaching about 300,000 of a population of a million. And in 1935, 60,000 Jews come to Palestine. That's double the number of the year before. And the Arabs of the country uh, are perceptive enough uh, not just the uh, more educated intelligentsia or the elites of the city, but even subsistence farmers in the countryside, many of whom were illiterate in this period, they were perceptive enough to, re to recognize that the face of the, of the land was changing and that if things went on this way, the Jews would be a, minor a majority before long. So there's a man whose name will be known to many of you. It's Iz Adin al Qassam. Qassam was a uh, preacher from Syria, he was a jihadi. Of course, his name, uh, he's lent his name, or rather his name has been bor borrowed by Hamas's armed wing, Hamas's terrorist wing that committed these atrocities of 10-7. Uh, so Qassam was a preacher. He was originally from Syria. He came down to Palestine in the early uh, 1920s because he was wanted by the French authorities up in Syria. And he sets up in Haifa and he's preaching at a mosque there to the urban Muslim poor of Haifa, uh, which in this period is still a, a majority Arab city. Uh, the, the mosque still stands. You can go go visit it. Uh, but he's preaching jihadism. He's preaching things like, um, you know, when the British officer uh, presents his boot for you to shine, leave your brush in the shine box and pick up your pistol, that sort of thing. And his uh, followers wage a number of sporadic uh, attacks against Jews and against the British. Some of them are even deadly. 
and they at a certain point kill a policeman, a member of the Palestine police named Moshe Rosenfeld. And that was a big mistake because they've, uh, they've killed a Jew, but they've killed a member of his majesty's police, and now he's a wanted man. Long story short, a manhunt ensues, and Kassam is killed by the British in the forests of what is now the northern West Bank. And he becomes sort of the first um, martyr in the Palestinian Arab pantheon. He becomes the proto-martyr. And Ben-Gurion, the head of the Jewish agency, recognizes the significance, significance of this uh, immediately. He writes in his diary, finally, the Arabs have found a man who uh, is willing to die for an ideal. And he predicted that hundreds or thousands more would follow. And indeed, just a few months after that, in April 1936, some of Kassam's followers ambush a Jewish a, a car on the road between Tulkaram and Nablus. It sounds like it could be ripped from the headlines today. Uh, they ambush a, a, a Jewish uh, poultry merchant and his driver, and they kill them. And this is often seen as the opening shots of the Arab revolt. And so the revolt begins in uh, violence, but very soon uh, the political leadership of uh, Arab Palestine rushes to assert its political control over it. And I'm going to mention uh, another name that will be known to many of you. That's Hajj Amin al-Husseini, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, the notorious Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, who, of course, in the 1940s uh, would spend much of World War II at Hitler's side uh, and who, if history had panned out slightly differently, probably would have been tried for war crimes. Uh, so Hajj Amin is the, the Grand Mufti. He's head of the Supreme Muslim Council, appointed to that position, by the way, uh, by the British, but that's a, that's a different lecture. It's a different talk. Um, Hajj Amin sort of rushes to assert his leadership and, um, and, uh, and he says that the, the revolt will continue and the boycott, the economic strike will continue because alongside uh, these acts of violence, a general strike has been proclaimed uh, in which the the uh, Arabs of Palestine essentially boycott the Jewish and British economies completely. And he says this will continue unless uh, our demands are met. Chief among them, a complete cessation of Jewish immigration and a complete ban on land sales because very many prominent wealthy Arabs were selling their land to Jews at uh, quite inflated prices, even while they railed against the practice in public. And um, and so the 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 revolt rages on for for a few a few more months, and it really bears fruit because the British send a royal commission to Palestine, acting in the name of the king. This is known uh, to history as the Peel Commission, the famous Peel Commission. They spend several months in the country, and they produce a report which clocks in at 400 plus pages. Uh, and if anyone has the entire month of November free, I strongly suggest they read it because it's actually a very good read. I've, all, I've read all of the commissions of inquiry on Palestine, or nearly all, and uh, it's, it's genuinely a good read. But it's remembered uh, by history mostly, mostly for its last 10 to 15 pages in which the commissioners offer a radical solution to the Jewish-Arab conflict, which is partition. This is the first two-state solution, if you like they propose a uh, small Jewish state, mostly along the coast and in, and in the Galilee, alongside an Arab state in uh, Palestine, which actually they propose be attached to Transjordan. Uh, and this is really the first time that a Jewish state uh, appears on the international agenda in any real way. This is not simply a Jewish national home as uh, proposed, as promised, by the Balfour Declaration. This is not a canton or an autonomous zone. This is a state with everything that that means. That means presumably an army. That means borders. That means control over immigration. And this is a direct uh, result of the Arab revolt. Ben-Gurion says something like, uh, we have to say thanks to the Mufti for, for launching this revolt in the first place. Ben-Gurion is euphoric, even as he sort of plays coy in, uh, in public. So this is and this, this partition plan becomes the template in many ways, at least the principle of it uh, becomes the template for every subsequent partition plan since, from the UN's exactly 10 years later in 1947 on to the various uh, iterations of our time. And so, again, this is a, a direct uh, result of the Arab revolt. 
And of course, the Mufti rejects the idea as a, as a, a degradation, an amputation, a humiliation. He rejects it out of hand. But that idea, that template has been, has been created. Uh, militarily, this is the period in which the Jews become an, art, an armed force to be reckoned with. This is the period when the seed of a Jewish army is sown. Uh, this is when the Haganah, which is the main the mainstream Jewish armed force of the time, which, by the way, is still technically illegal at the time uh, to the British in, in under British law, but they tolerate it as long as it kind of, excuse me, behaves itself. The Haganah goes from a, a, a collection, a loose network of glorified uh, night watchmen to really the seed of a Jewish army. And this all happens through uh, the good offices of uh, the British military. This is often, and the British government, this is often forgotten. But basically, the, P, the revolt is raging most fiercely um, in 1938, roughly. The, the British have proposed this Peel partition plan, but once they see that uh, Hajj Amin, who's the Arab leader who matters most, has rejected it, um, although interestingly, a lot of, quite a few other prominent Arabs accepted it, and we can get into that in the Q&A. But once they see that the Arab leadership of Palestine rejects it uh, completely, uh, and once the foreign office gets involved, because there's wrangling between the foreign office and the colonial office in this period, they start to walk back partition, they start to reconsider. And uh, by 37, 38, it's quite clear that the war clouds are gathering over Europe, that it seems to be a question of when and not if uh, war with Hitler will erupt. Uh, although at the time, at this period, of course, the prime minister is Neville Chamberlain, so it seems to have been clear to everyone except perhaps him. Uh, and so they simply, they're trying to wrestle this uh, revolt in Palestine to the ground, and they conduct some fairly brutal and heavy-handed measures, which I'll get into a bit later, but they're unable to really wrestle it to the ground. So what do they do? They agree to a long-standing uh, Jewish demand to arm and train them in large numbers because the British are simply unable to move large amounts of manpower of their own army from Europe. And so they create this unit called the Jewish uh, Supernumerary Police. And it's a bit of a mouthful. In Hebrew, we call it the Notrim. And through this mechanism, some 15 to 20,000 uh, Jews are armed and trained and often paid by the British administration of Palestine. But it's clear to everyone that uh, they're ultimately answerable to the Haganah. This is also the period of a, a man whose name, another man whose name uh, will be known to many of you, and that's Ord Wingate. Uh, Wingate was a very eccentric British officer. He had a habit of uh, welcoming guests in the nude. He had a habit of eating onions like apples, oftentimes in the nude. Uh, but he was, a, um, he was a Christian fundamentalist. We'd probably call him an evangelical these days. He was a devout Zionist, which set him apart from almost all of his comrades in the British army in Palestine and the British administration there. And most important of all, he was a military genius by any account. And he created something called Special Night Squads, which were a mixed uh, British Jewish unit that operated at night and took the fight to the enemy, to these Arab armed uh, bands. And um, in doing so, he really created the first Jewish special forces if you like, and really the core of the future IDF uh, leadership. This, these, these night squads included men like uh, Moshe Dayan and Yigal Alon, who would go on to be leaders of, of the Israeli army, the Israeli defense establishment. Um, and so, uh, and so, so we've talked about politics, we've talked about the military, uh, economically, the Jews of this period, Ben Gurion saw in the Arab revolt, a tremendous source of leverage to realize his long-standing goal of creating a self-sufficient Jewish uh, economy that could feed itself and house itself and employ itself, uh, defend itself without any help from the British or the Arabs. This is, uh, this is the period in which Tel Aviv port opens, for example. Jaffa port is boycotting in solidarity with the strike and the Jews petition the British to open up a quote unquote uh, Jewish port in Tel Aviv. I'm sure many of you have been to the Tel Aviv port area in the north of the city and had a, a coffee or a drink there. Uh, and, and the British agree, and Ben-Gurion is simply ecstatic. He, views, he says, you know, this is our outlet to the world. He called it a second uh, Balfour Declaration. Again, a direct result of the revolt. Um, in terms of settlement, 
the Jews don't abandon any settlements throughout these three years of revolt. And bear in mind, this was an extremely uh, painful period for the Jews. That 500 Jews were killed between 36 and 39. And perhaps that number isn't quite as impactful as it might have been before October 7th, but it's a massive number. It's a number that we wouldn't see until the Second Intifada. And this is, of course, in a period when the Jewish population of Palestine, of the land of Israel, is much, much smaller, is, as I mentioned, about 300,000 people. Uh, and so uh, settlement, they, 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 not a single settlement is abandoned. Dozens more spring up in uh, strategic parts of the country. This is when uh, the whole phenomenon of wall and tower begins, which some of you may be familiar with. There was an old Ottoman law that the British kept on the books, which stated that if you put up a structure uh, within 24 hours, if you put it up overnight, say, uh, it was allowed to stay up. It couldn't be taken down. So the Jews took full advantage of this and put up these little fortresses all over uh, the country. So in all of these ways, the the Jews, the, uh, the Zionists, created the the springboard uh, in 1939 as this result as this revolt fizzles out and is wrestled to the ground. And as the Second World War begins, the Jews have created the springboard uh, and the the core, the kernel for the state that they would create. Uh, a decade down the road, and for the Arabs, for the for the for the Arabs of Palestine, and you know, terminology is often tricky in this conflict, as you know. I try to use the terms that were most in currency at the time uh, in the book to really place the reader in that time, and so that's why I, I keep referring to Palestinian Arabs, Arabs of Palestine, Jews of Palestine. For the Arabs uh, in this period, it's really the mirror image of those Jewish gains. The, the, the revolt to crush uh, Zionism really ends up crushing the Arabs themselves. Um, the, the British, as I mentioned briefly, waged a very heavy uh, counterinsurgency, arguably even a brutal one. Uh, this is the period in which home demolitions begin on a massive scale. Um, and just, co you know, collective punishment is simply part of the game in this period. If there's, if there's an attack on British troops, uh, for example, the British would simply go to the nearest village. They would take out the village headman, the Mukhtar, and say, okay, who, who did it? And if you couldn't tell them, they would start demolishing houses. Uh, they hanged at least 100 Arabs, killed thousands, although we'll never know exactly how many. Um, huge numbers of Arabs are put into prison. Huge numbers of weapons are confiscated. Um, and, um, and alongside all of that, there's just a convulsion of Arab infighting in this period. So however many thousands of Arabs were killed by the British, many more were killed by their fellow Arabs. There were, this was a, a period, the initial unity of the revolt in those first six months before the Peel Commission arrived, for example, gives way to just, it sort of devolves into just a, just a paroxysm of, of of inter-Arab fighting under the cover of this ostensibly uh, nationalistic revolt. There's a lot of score settling, old scores being uh, settled. Um, you know, the elite of the country flees the country in large numbers. This is another precursor to 1948. Um, the economy is simply gutted by the boycott and by this counterinsurgency. So in all of these ways, British, uh, excuse me, the Arab social fabric is just completely torn. And, um, and so I, I, I argue in the book that the final the the final showdown the final reckoning between jews and arabs in the holy land that we saw in 1947-48 after the kind of pause of the second world war that final reckoning the final showdown was won by one side and lost by another nearly 10 years uh, in advance and so i as i mentioned i do want to leave a lot of time for for q a so i'll start to wrap up here I think I'll wrap up with 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 a thought about the present. Um, you know, we the, the people who were who were lost on ten seven we we can't we can't bring those people back. Um, but you know, I think if this if this pogrom that we saw a month ago, and I think we do have to call it that, I think if it leads to the defeat of this uh, terror organization that calls itself Hamas. And if it if it can continue to to uh, contribute to the greater unity and solidarity of, of the people of Israel, I think um, I think we'll be able to see some some light shining through these 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 dark clouds, and even to to be able to say with uh, 
with even greater conviction those those three words that so many of you know, which is uh, Am Yisrael Chai. So I think uh, on that note, I'm happy to take any questions that anyone has about uh, about the past, about the present, um, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Oren. I want to remind everybody, that please stay on mute, and if you have comments or questions, please put them in the chat, and I will gather them and uh, you know and, and uh, convey them to Oren. Uh, Oren, thank you, first of all, for beginning with your personal experience um, on that day, and Mazel Tov for your wedding. Um, I'm sure very bittersweet in in its recollection, but uh, it's important to um, preserve the joyous even in the face of that which is catastrophic. Um, so thank you for that, and uh, certainly a, a lot here, both in you know your discussion of the recent events, but also providing us with some of the roots going back to the 30s and the parties who were at war then and in different Gilgulim, different manifestations continue to be at war now. Um, I'll start with the, the first question. Someone asked, um, what did you discover as you were working on the book, as you were researching the book that surprised you? Or, or what, perhaps to expand that a little bit, were there any conclusions you arrived at that you didn't expect to arrive at? Well, one of the most fascinating uh, troves that I found in my, ar in my archival research were the secret uh, testimonies from the Peel Commission. So the, there were dozens of public testimonies given at the time in 1936 and 37, which were released alongside the report. Uh, but there were dozens more of secret testimonies, which were never meant to be released. Uh, they were meant to be destroyed. And it was only thanks to a far-seeing, far-sighted um, secretary of this commission, a man by the name of uh, J.M. Martin, I believe, who wrote in the, who stowed away a couple of copies and wrote in the margins, uh, these ought to be preserved because they will be uh, of tremendous interest to the historians of Palestine and the Jewish people in the remote future. So we are those historians of the remote future. Uh, and they were released 80 years later, very quietly, without any fanfare or any announcement by the British. Uh, they were released in 2017. And um, other than one scholar in Canada by the name of Leila Parsons, who dipped her toe into some of these transcripts, some of these testimonies, they hadn't really been uh, examined before by by scholars. And so you can see, I don't want to give uh, too much away because then no one will read the book, but uh, you can see in, um, in these uh, proceedings how in the final days of their stay in in Palestine, the commissioners are eager for a solution, particularly one of them who's a, a don at Oxford, and how they quite quickly and hastily, arguably even rashly, just just put together this <laughs> this two state solution over a couple of pages of testimony. Uh, and it's quite um, you know I think we tend to think that there's, there's there's a grand strategy involved with these great historical decisions, but often you know these are human beings and um, and uh, I think that was really fascinating to see how this drastic idea came together. There was one other uh, really fascinating testimony that I discovered, which I, I wrote an article about this for the Times of Israel. It's with Herbert Samuel, who is the first High Commissioner for Palestine and notably a Jew and a Zionist. He was the first Jew to serve in the British uh, cabinet. He played a tremendous role in putting Zionism on the on the table in, in um, of the British government, even before the Balfour Declaration, as early as 1915. And Samuel, it was Samuel who appointed uh, Haj Amin, this 24, 25 year old um, kind of nobody uh, from a prominent family from the Husseinis to this tremendously powerful position of Grand Mufti of Jerusalem and head of the Supreme Muslim Council. And so they ask, they, so this is now 17 years after that appointment is made and they ask him what were you thinking why did you by by this point the mufti is a wanted man by the british he's fled to uh beirut to lebanon because he's wanted um for essentially guiding this revolt along its along its main uh lines and they ask him why why did you appoint this guy what were you thinking essentially and uh Again, I, I, we don't have uh, we don't have time to to get into all of the details there, but it's a fascinating uh, it's a fascinating look at uh, at British decision making, and I think it's one of the greatest blunders in the hundred year history of this.
conflict was uh, with, with tremendous repercussions to this day. I think this is one of the huge what ifs of this period and of this research that I've done is what if uh, someone else had been appointed to this position. That's not to suggest that it's the fault of one man, whether Herbert Samuel or Haj Amin, that things have uh, gone in the direction that they have. But um, it's tantalizing to think what could have happened had someone else been vested, someone more more moderate, uh, someone with the interests of the Arabs of Palestine at heart, uh, and with a bit more moderation towards the Jews, uh, what, what could, could have played out differently. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, there are two questions relating to uh, British policy. Um, one, the question of the proposed partition and the creation of Jordan and how Jordan fit, fits into this whole um, you know, analysis. And then you spoke of the quick growth of the Jewish population in Palestine. You didn't mention British limitations on Jewish immigration. So how did how did those figure into this story uh, at the same time? I'll, I'll, I'll answer the, the second one first at the risk of going chronologically backwards. Uh, I have a whole chapter in the book about the, the white paper of 1939, which is really a crucial part of this story. And if I if I had a bit more time, I would have uh, gotten to it. But the, when the this is the era of uh, appeasement. This is the Chamberlain government. And that's a word that was used not only by people like Winston Churchill, who opposed it. This was essentially government policy and not just vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Nazi Germany and fascist Italy, but in the Middle East as well. And I've read the cabinet papers and they talk quite openly about, quote, appeasing Arab and Muslim opinion uh, ahead of the world war. They were particularly worried about the large Muslim population of India. This is something that's often forgotten. Of course, India at this period includes Pakistan, what we now call Pakistan and Bangladesh. And they were worried that if the Muslims of the empire were not on board, if they were angry about Palestine, that it would cause real problems for the war effort. And so uh, so the, the British call a, a conference in London. They, they invite the Jews, they invite the Arabs uh, to St. James's Palace. But the, the conclusion of this conference is basically foregone. It's severe limitation on Jewish immigration. It's a significant rollback of it's a it's a reneging not just on this partition plan proposed two years earlier by Peel. It's essentially a reneging on the Balfour Declaration. It's essentially saying our work is mostly done here. And so I mentioned earlier that 60,000 Jews came to Palestine in 1935. Well, the white paper of 39. And again, this is spring summer of 1939, a crucial time for the Jews of Europe, a very dangerous time, of course. And so this white paper stipulates that over the next five years total, 75,000 Jews can come total, after which any further immigration is content would be contingent on uh, Arab consent, which of course was clear to everyone would not be forthcoming. So this is seen as a tremendous uh, betrayal by the Jews and by many others. And this is the beginning of the end of that kind of British Zionist partnership. Um, uh, uh, and so uh, to get to the earlier part of the question, I'll try to answer briefly. Um, Transjordan was established in 1921 by col colonial secretary, whose name will be known to you, it's Winston Churchill. Churchill was a um, was essentially not a lifelong Zionist, but once the Zionist idea emerged, he was he was a pretty steady supporter of Zionism. And um, but there were other imperial considerations after the First World War, one of which was kind of um, satisfying the Hashemite family, which had been run out of uh, its its um, kingdom in, in what we now call Saudi Arabia. And um, I won't get into the details, but they briefly ruled Syria before the French kicked them out. Uh, and um, and so they they kind of Churchill famously one afternoon sort of gifted the land uh, east of the Jordan to one of the Hashemites by the name of Abdullah. And um, and by the and for the Zionists, this was seen also as a as a real betrayal, particularly by the Jabotinskyite revisionist faction, which I haven't talked about, but which is extremely important in this period, the kind of right wing dissident, more maximalist uh, faction, which saw this as a tremendous betrayal. And for many years after that would um, would, you know, you could see their logo. It includes both uh, the land west and east of the Jordan, even throughout the 30s and 40s. Um, yeah. I had to unmute there. Um, you mentioned um, Arab factions uh, fighting against one another 
um, in the midst of this. So someone asked about that, if you might say more about what those factions were. But I think it's often said that the uh, Arab revolt uh, is at the foundation of the development of a modern Palestinian national identity. Um, so, you know, you've got division and you've got the possibility of unity under a new identity. Can you comment on both sides of that? Absolutely. And these, these are really great questions. Um, I, I view the Arab revolt, I present the Arab revolt as, as the crucible in which Palestinian or Palestinian Arab identity really coalesces. It's not to suggest that there was nothing before, but this is really where it comes together in a cohesive way, where, where almost all of Arab Palestine unites, um, at least ostensibly, at least on the surface, uh, behind the leadership of the Mufti, and most, more importantly, in a, in a common purpose against the common foe, namely Zionism and its uh, British midwife in, in the Arab perception. So uh, urban and rural, rich and poor, even Muslim and Christian to a, a, a significant extent, lines up uh, together in this one effort. Um, the other part of the question was about the Arab factions. And so really at this period, there are five or six powerful Jerusalem families that have been, that have been powerful since the Ottoman era, but the real, the, the main rivalry is between the Husseinis and their allies and the Nashashibis and their allies. And at the risk of simplifying, the Husseinis were typically more nationalist, more intransigent, although there are notable exceptions, such as the Mufti before, uh, the notorious Mufti was, his half brother was actually quite moderate, uh, but the Nashashibis were uh, considered generally more moderate, more willing to work with the British, more more willing to work with the Jews, more cognizant of the benefits that the Jews were bringing. That's not to suggest that they were Zionists by any stretch, but importantly, the Nashashibi camp accepted the Peel Partition Plan. So, speaking of what ifs, this is this is, you know, imagine that a Nashashibi had been in the key position that Hajamin had and had accepted this partition plan. Um, you know, they th think of the think of what could have happened and what could have what might have not happened. Uh, you you might have had hundreds of thousands of Jews spared from the Nazis uh, if you had had a Jewish state in 1937. You might have had the whole crisis, the Palestinian refugee crisis of 1947, 48, 49 could have been completely averted. You know, Gaza today in 2023 wouldn't have been uh, teeming with refugees. So it's just. Um, so it's, I think it's important, one kind of takeaway that I have from this book is that there were many points in the period that I'm writing about at which things could have gone differently, uh, which suggests that maybe they still can. Hmm. Okay, well, that's hopeful. I, I mean, the fact that you can even think about that is wonderful. Um, this is a history of a lot of what ifs. Uh, you've made that clear. And as we're all listening to you, uh, it's clear that there are many other what ifs in the decades that follow what you just commented on. Um, just allow you uh, one final comment. You know, if this is the DNA of today, if what you write about is the DNA of today, um, what do we need to know about that DNA that makes, you know, what's mutable, what's immutable? Do you have a way of thinking about that? Well, I think I, I think I, um, that answer I gave to the last question, I should have given to this question, okay. which is, <laughs> which is uh, you know, it was we weren't, I don't think, my research doesn't suggest to me anyway, that we were inexorably, inexorably drawn to indefinite conflict. I think there were many crossroads at which things could have gone differently, things could have gone uh, better. So that's in the, even in these very difficult, dark times, I, I, I try to, uh, to take some inspiration uh, from, from that. Well, that's itself an inspirational statement. So thank you very much. Um, this book can be purchased however you purchase books, though, uh, Oren, do you have a preferred, uh, I, I mean, I always give the authors an opportunity to say, where would you prefer people uh, purchase your book if you have a preference? The um, So Amazon actually ran, since October 7th, this, this topic has become so tragically topical that uh, that Amazon ran out for a few weeks there. They've they've got copies now, but I think th there's a bit of a lag time in delivery, maybe two weeks or something. Probably the fastest way to get the book is by going straight to um, to the publisher 
Roman and Littlefield. So that's Roman.com. Mm-hmm. I hope it'll be back at Barnes and Noble soon, but again, they 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 ran out. Uh, so um, Amazon or straight to the publisher would be my best um, my best suggestion. Okay, great. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Oren, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I I hope those of you who were uh, following along had a chance to see other comments in the uh, chat because there have been several of them and uh, representing a variety of points of view. That's wonderful. Uh, And I just want to say at the end, on behalf of the Library of JTS, Uh, This provides a good model of the kinds of conversations that you will hear if you tune in to our book talks, and I invite you to consider the list that we will distribute to you uh, of upcoming talks and join us again in the future. I wish everyone well. I wish us all uh, more peace, um, less heartache, uh, and uh, Oren, with you, and I, I really... I, 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 you deserve a lot of credit for this. Uh, more hope, because that's really what we all need these days. Thank you all so much. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Yeah.